praise the Most High. Come, all you people, come and praise the Most High. Come, all you people, come and praise the Most High. Come now and worship the Lord. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized. And what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ.
I also see faith as that spark of the Holy Spirit that seeks to ignite and unite us. That, that, that divine fire that, that sets us ablaze. The spark of the Spirit that is often that gut feeling that you and I might have. You know, and I especially like this term, gut feeling. You know, I'm sure you do, right? And it adds sort of this inspiration. And, you know, back in my younger days when I had that gut feeling, I said, oh, that's a great inspiration. Only later in life did I realize that, that it's really the Holy Spirit speaking to me and trying to encourage me to, to take one path over another. And of course, I didn't always listen. <laughs> but I especially like the term gut feeling as it was explained by my nephew, Skyler, who I hope to have back here someday when maybe I'm preaching again. He's got a wonderful voice, wonderful vocalist. Mm -hmm. But but Skyler says, for him, gut feeling, gut is really an, ac an acronym, G-U-T. For him, it stands for God uttering truth. Gut, feeling, God, uttering truth. Yes, and, and, and through these utterances of, of gut tingling truth, to allow God's will to overcome my self will, to overcome my ego. And there's another one of Skyler's words, ego. It's another acronym. For him, it is edging God out. Edging God out. Gut, God out of truth, ego, edging God. And so when we edge God out, when we ignore those gut feelings instead acting on our own self-will, we really ignore God's persuasive efforts, God's inbreaking into our lives in a way. We ignore the faith being freely offered. We ignore God. And in effect, we act unfaithfully. Unfaithful? Wait, 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 Nancy. Isn't that like adultery? <laughs> And that commandment about not committing adultery, does it also pertain to well, the way God and I relate? And this gets me to inviting you to see faith, not as some high-powered theological term, but as a relational term. And funny, it was a theologian who helped me see and understand the difference. Years ago, I heard Marcus Ford speak of faith as relationship rather than the ways we normally think of faith. Org's view of faith is very interactive, and it made me recall how when the people of Israel were faithful with God, when they kept their focus on God, when they listened and acted according to God's plan for them, what happened? Life for them flourished. But when they were unfaithful with God, when they strayed from the past, when they were seduced by other gods and moved by idols, by other lovers, you might say, or when they thought they knew what was best for themselves and could do it all by themselves, when they edged God out, life became deadly and oppressive. In some instances, literally deadly and oppressive, as they were dragged away and became exiles and captives in faraway lands. But here's the beauty about God. Even infidelity did not keep God away from them. As their faithful God ultimately brought them home, spiritually and physically, and restored his covenant and his relationship with them time and time and time again. In fact, in the Old Testament, the phrase is called the Deuteronomic cycle. It's, it's this case of the people getting into trouble, crying out to God for help. God comes and helps them and forgives them, thus oops, dusts them off, and they're on their way again, only to do the same thing again and again and again every time God forgives them. And that's good news for us, too. And then finally, as, and here's, here's the, 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 the ultimate forgiveness, finally, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, a new covenant is established between God and God's people. Sins were forgiven. Faith was per perfected for everyone. Forever. The cross of Jesus, in a way, bridged the unfaithful gap between God and humankind and a new relationship was ushered in. Could I have an amen for that? Amen. <laughs> and speaking of the cross, I'm reminded of a conversation with another seminarian long ago who told me how for him the cross was likewise about relationships, but in a, a somewhat different way. As he saw the cross, he said, you know, the, the, the vertical part of the cross is the longer part, and for him it visualized the relationship between God and each person. And, and first we have to have this, this faithful grounding in a way 
with this part of the cross, this part of the relationship. And once we achieve that, then, and only then, can we begin to form loving and faithful relationships with one another. So it's a matter of God and us, and then us and others. I like it. I still like it. And because being faithful is not about just our covenantal vows with God, but it's also about our vows and our relationships with others. Starting with the members here of St. Paul's as you gather together to love and serve God and to love and serve one another too. Sort of like the two great commandments, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Love, love God and love your neighbor and be the neighbor. Remember that? This is America. So as, as your new chapter of church life begins next week, why not pray and seek to be faithful with your God, your pastor, with one another? as you're persuaded by God to live according to God's will and acting on your gut feelings. Reminded that God always has your best interests at heart. And as Jesus explains, you don't need a lot of faith to accomplish that. A little faith goes a long way. For Jesus says elsewhere in the Gospels, for truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, let me hit the pause button there, I never knew how big a mustard seed was. <laughs> do you? Well, yeah, you do. Yeah. So what did, what did I do? I went to Big Y and got some mustard seed. And actually, there's some in little final parts with the scriptural quotation from Matthew talking about faith the size of a mustard seed. But oh my gosh, uh, here here it is. <laughs> So, so it's, it's extremely small, and I think Jesus makes a very illustrative point by, by using the mustard seed as his frame of reference. Because he says, if you have faith the size of that mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And here's the thing, nothing, he says, nothing will be impossible. Yes, when in close personal relationship with God and Jesus Christ, and in close personal personal relationship with your sisters and brothers in Christ here in St. Paul's and beyond, the possibilities are endless. Endless. You know, in the United Church of Christ's UCC statement of faith, we affirm that God calls us into his church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship. So these close, intimate relationships that we're talking about are not only rich and rewarding, but they can also be challenging and difficult. Yes, really admitting to our faith can cause other folks to distance themselves from us. As the old saying goes about being judged by the company you keep. One of my uh, seminary faculty, again, years and years ago, spoke of our school as being I love the phrase, unapologetically Christian. Unapologetically Christian. And I think that same term needs to apply to each of us who make up this church right here and the, and the universal church. That we can speak and witness in loving ways to the works of Jesus Christ with no need to apologize, no need to make excuses, even if it makes others uncomfortable and step away from us. And Jesus recognizes that's likely to happen when in our gospel story today, and thank you, by the way, too, Carol, for reading all those wonderful scriptures. In our gospel story, Jesus tells the crowds that he did not come to bring, bring peace to the earth, but division. That, that really caught me. You know, that, I, I was scratching my head for that one for a while. Because it's a word that means a breaking up as a family is separated from families we heard. That then, though, becomes the risk of faithfulness. It's the risk of faithfulness. That risk of being unapologetically Christian, of having the faith that size of a mustard seed, of being, as Jesus himself says at one point, of being in the world, he tells disciples, but not of the world, being in the world, but not of the world, being criticized and persecuted for your faith, for your unhidden and affirming relationship with Jesus Christ. But, Jesus says, there's also reward as we hear in the Sermon on the Mount, where he assures his listeners that they are blessed when people revile them, persecute them, utter all kinds of evil against them falsely on account of Jesus, and for them to rejoice and be glad when that happens, since their reward will be great. 
getting back to my fondness for understanding words and their Greek meanings, I love the Greek word for church. It's, and it, it's very familiar because you're, you're deacons go through this process. I know my cousin who's in the LC church went through this process of, of ecclesia, right? Mm -hmm. So the Greek word for church is ecclesia. It's, it's, it's where our word ecclesiastical comes from, right? Ecclesia. And it, it tells a similar story to, to, to the gospel lesson today. It tells a similar story to the, the divisions we face and will continue to face as unapologetic Christians. Its meaning in the Greek speaks to people who are called out from the world and called to God. That's what it means. Called out from the world, called to God. Separated, right? There we go. Divided, separated from many out there, yet gathered together and united in here, in covenant, in faithfulness, often speaking and acting in ways that are very, very different to the secular culture out there. Those out there stumble because they disobey the word, as Peter writes in his first letter. But he goes on to say that those in faith community, and that's us, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Even Luther said it, right? He said, we are the priesthood of all believers, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that we may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are the church. You. Oh no, I'll stop there. <laughs> not, not one of my strong suits. But we are, we are the church called out of the darkness, called out from the world, and called to the light of Christ. Take a moment now. Look around you. And I mean it seriously. Look around you right now. You are surrounded. You are surrounded. You are surrounded. You are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Not to mention past generations, and stories from scripture, and stories from our Christian history, and stories of Martin Luther himself. Witnesses, folks unapologetic about their faith, joined together to worship, and then to go forth and proclaim and to serve. Like the story of the sower, we too are called, I won't do it with these, we too are called to cast forth seeds, aren't we? We're called to go out there and be the sower and cast forth seeds, knowing that some will land in good soil, but also knowing some will not. And some in here will become disciples, but some will not. Because as we proclaim and witness out there, with no apologies for who we are and for whose we are, there will be times our message will not be heard when our message may, in fact, cause even greater division. Luther himself said, the gospel cannot be truly preached without offense and tumult. Without offense and tumult. In those cases where we and our words are not welcome, though, it's okay. And our instruction from Jesus recounted in Matthew 10, 14, is to shake the dust from our feet when that happens and leave the house or town where so you see, as crazy as it may sound in secular terms, but not in spiritual terms, we first need to, to divide, to separate ourselves from those unwilling to have a faithful relationship with Jesus. That's tough, that's sad, but it's true and needs to be done. And then, once we divide, we need to multiply, to reach out through our words and our actions to those who are in fact hungry to hear more by welcoming them into our cloud of witnesses, encouraging them and nurturing them in the faith such that they too can grow in the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ and like you, bear witness to all his marvelous and miraculous works. So, St. Paul's, here you are, a new lap of the race about to begin. And as you get ready to run, as we heard in Hebrews, look to Jesus as the role model for the faithful endurance you are called to demonstrate. Knowing Jesus has freed you from your sin, set you free to live more fully and more faithfully. Dividing and multiplying will both take lots of effort, admittedly, as it did for Jesus, it will for you. But united with Jesus, united with each other, united with Pastor Clements, 
Not only will you endure, but you will prevail individually and as St. Paul's. You are the church, set apart, divided, yet called to multiply. Mm -hmm. And moving forward in faith, with faith even the size of a mustard seed, and I do have some back there, don't forget to take this, <laughs> as, a, as a subtle reminder of your, in fact, you don't need a lot. But moving forward in faith, even with size of a mustard seed, the possibilities, the possibilities are amazing and endless. Mm -hmm. God is always speaking to you. God is always attempting to persuade you. God is there to fulfill his promises to you, to make your lives more abundant. Even Jesus said it, right? Elsewhere in scripture, he says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And continue to reveal to you, to reveal to you good things that right now are, are yet to be seen. No one, I think, said that phrase better than John Robinson, who was the leader of the pilgrims. And it's an interesting story about Robinson because he actually never got to see the new world. He chose to wait and send off his, his band of, of pilgrims on Mayflower, but chose to wait to a later time to join them in the new world. And then he died, and he never got to see the new world. Sort of like, it reminded me a little bit of Moses, you know, he gets to a glimpse of the promised land, but never gets to cross it to him. But as Robinson joined with his pilgrims as they were boarding the boat to start their journey, his parting words then were these. For I am very confident that the Lord hath more truth and light yet to bring forth his holy word. I am very confident that the Lord has more truth and light yet to bring forth out of his holy word. It's my parting words for you too. Know that it is true for you that God 